Okay, so we're up, we're, we're recording, hopefully it works. Uh, so in order for the Hardy-Weinberg equation to work, we need to be in genetic equilibrium, right? The equation really falls apart if, there's, if the allele frequencies aren't being held constant. Uh, large population size are important because that prevents what's called genetic drift. And I'll talk about genetic drift a little bit today. Um, no migrations in or out of population, right? If I have a huge, uh, if I'm looking at a, a, uh, a fish population that happens to be in genetic equilibrium in a large um, group of similar species moves into the population, allele frequencies are going to change. And if allele frequencies change, are we in genetic equilibrium? No, genetic equilibrium is implying that allele frequencies are staying the same. Um, no net mutations, which really leads to no natural selection, right? If there's a mutation that makes one portion of the population more fit than the other, are the allele frequencies going to stay the same? No, they are going to. They're going to change, so we wouldn't be in genetic equilibrium. So the really no net mutations really goes along with um, natural selection. And then the random mating aspect, right? There has to be random mating. Um, if there's a selection in the mating process, right, we're not going to be in genetic equilibrium. So all these criteria need to be met, which are all pretty straightforward. The only one we need to expand upon is that large population size. Uh, with small population size, we can skew away from what probability tells us. Right, so that's why large populations help to kind of mitigate that. Yes. Well, but there is a selection. Yeah. But so, so any any basically any organism that that has some type of a structured society, there's going random mating is not going to exist. So it's only in like the last third. For the most part. Yes, yes, for the most part. Um, really, you're kind of looking towards the concept of internal versus external fertilization. If it's external fertilization, there's more chance for random mating. Um, yeah, so like plants, you definitely yeah. Um, all right. Now, we, we kind of talked about this briefly, but um, genetic drift. In small populations, we can skew away from what probability tells us, right? If I flip the point twice, I get two heads. That statistically is telling us that we should get heads every time, which we know is not true. If I flip it a thousand times, I'm going to be pretty close to 500, 500. And so small populations kind of, you know, prevent any shift away from what probability tells us. So that, that's definitely key to this. However, with genetic drift, we have that small population size. But there's also two other major kind of concepts that kind of fall under the genetic drift category as well. Um, one is the bottleneck effect, and one is the founder effect. Um, the bottleneck effect is really what's kind of shown up here. Um, here's my two-liter bottle of Skittles. My kids love this. Um, so let's say we have an even distribution of red, yellow, green, purple, orange inside. Uh, I take this bottle, I dip it, upside, I dip it upside down real quick. I only let a few Skittles come out. And the skittles that come out are red, 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 orange, orange, green, green, yellow, yellow, yellow. <clears throat> is the new population allele frequencies representative of the initial population's allele frequencies? No, it was a bottleneck effect, right? It was something that kind of killed off a large portion of the population. This is what happens with the bottleneck effect. Now, to put this more into real world, um, you can think of a lot of different organisms. Cheetahs have undergone this. Uh, cheetahs have undergone a, a bottleneck effect because of natural disasters, droughts, uh, uh, environmental uh, changes, but also because of human disturbances. So cheetahs used to have a lot of genetic diversity, but because of overhunting, because of development, uh, because of droughts, the cheetah population has been decimated. And when the cheetah population was decimated, the diversity went along with it. Um, so they went from an area of having high levels of diversity um, to, to having lower levels of diversity. Hence, cheetahs are kind of endangered in a sense because there's such little genetic diversity within them. Um, and it happened because of a bottleneck effect. A large portion of the population was destroyed, a small group of populations remaining. It, it, it's usually going to affect the, the variation within that population, diversity within the population. Um, the second one is a founder effect, which is kind of shown here. <coughs> I just fall. <laughs> that was really scary. Oh, no. We have that on tape, by the way. That, that's <laughs> um, so I'm just literally, that went, I, I, I came back up, but it went down the wrong hole. Like that was, I had a moment like, uh oh. 
<laughs> um, all right, that's fun. We get to listen to that later on YouTube. Um, so, in any case, founder effect. Founder effect, and here's my initial population. This is common with bugs. A small subset of the bug population moves to another tree in another area. What happens? Um, the, the, the new population allele frequency is not representative of the initial population allele frequency. Hence, right, we, have, um, we have some type of change uh, in allele frequencies. You guys know I'm chatting right now, right? I don't mind you chatting. And make sure you're not being distracted from class either. Um, so, uh, with the founder effect, here I can do this. I'll just go. Like uh, so, with the founder effect, we get a, a shift in allele frequencies um, because of the new population being founded or generated. Okay, um, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, no migrations in or out, which is pretty evident. Are we okay with this? Um, no net mutations. Of course, we can't stop mutations, but if one portion of the population gets more fit than the other, that, that would be effective. This is really speaking more to natural selection. Random mating, right? There can't be any selection process in the mating, so therefore, your lower level organisms typically. I just have some pictures, so I'll put it in. Um, <clears throat> And then, obviously, no natural selection, right? If there's natural selection going on, we're not in genetic equilibrium. If all that's met, you're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and then your problem set makes a lot of sense. Right? You can actually do the calculation to figure out the differences. Everybody's okay. All right, so that was all kind of old stuff. Um, how are your labs coming? Are you kind of hopefully somewhat done with those? Somewhat done. You're not really going to have any more class time for it. So, um, I'll, I'll set a date tomorrow, but it'll be due sometime probably towards the end of the week we get back. So probably like Thursday of the week we get back. So just kind of keep some time. Okay. Now what we're interested in with is how does natural selection actually affect populations? So, so what does it look like when natural selection is, is acting upon a population? And what we're focused on is we're focused here on polygenic traits. Um, if it's a single gene trait, it, it's pretty easy to envision, right? I have the frequency of one trait and the frequency of the other trait, and they're probably going to go up and down accordingly. So it kind of looks like a bar graph. If the frequency of one goes up, the frequency of the other one goes down. So the bar graphs are kind of you know, uh, inversely proportional to one another. Pretty straightforward. What we're looking at here are really polygenic traits. Um, and you can't really graph them with the bar graph. You're going to graph them with, with a bell curve. I just think of human height. You can't put them into categories in a bar graph. However, we can put them along a continuum right, within a bell curve. So the, the types of selection we're going to look at are directional selection, stabilizing selection, disruptive selection. Right? Um, directional selection looks like this. Here's my initial population. We're looking at Darwin's benches. Um, what we have here is you know, most people lie in the median, in the middle. So therefore, the largest part of the population, the, the largest numbers fall with the the median size beak. As you get towards smaller or taller, or if you're talking human height, shorter or taller people, there are far less people who are three foot two, uh, and there are far less people who are seven foot six than people who are about five foot five, five foot six. Um, so here we're looking at beak size stuff. Right? And what we're saying with the colors, we're saying fitness lies with the larger beak size. So they, they must have moved to. Um, so the, the birds landed on an island, uh, maybe with a larger food source, that favored birds with larger beaks. So they're showing that fitness, low mortality, high fitness, so uh, reproductive success is happening with the birds with larger beaks compared to the birds with smaller beaks. Over time, what's going to happen to the average beak size? It's going to increase, so that curve will shift to the right. Notice the curve, for the most part, maintains its shape, and it's random in that nature. It's not necessarily what it is actually. But it typically will be somewhere similar to that. Um, so this is directional selection. Could it be selected in the other direction? Yeah, they landed on an island with a different fruit source. They could shift smaller as well. So it could be either direction. Next one, stabilizing selection. Uh, best two examples for this are birth weight in babies or the number of eggs with birds. There are two great examples for this. Um, 
With babies, there used to be a, a greater range of birth weights. Babies were born, you know, two, three pounds and up to 15, 16, 17 pounds. Um, both of those have low fitness. Low fitness in, in, in lower birth weights, so even though we're better at today, I'm talking about early human uh, existence. Um, lower birth weights made the baby weaker, tougher to survive the elements. Um, you know, don't think of us in our fantasy hospitals, think about us, you know, back when we, you know, lived in the woods. Uh, so therefore, lower birth weights were less fit, higher birth weights were less fit, because there could be complications during, um, during birth, so, so major complications there as well. So over time, birth weight in babies is stabilized, right? The middle is selected for, and you see how the curve is, is uh, pressing in. Um, the number of eggs with birds is another great example for this, right? Uh, birds could lay 20, 30 eggs if they wanted to. However, Birds have a lot of parental care. So if they have 20, 30 chicks, they need to feed 20 or 30 chicks. That sometimes would be hard to do. Therefore, they could kind of make the entire um, the entire generation, uh, could put them all at risk because they could feed all of them. Um, in the reverse, birds only have two or three eggs. However, birds are preyed upon a lot. So therefore, two or three eggs is a high possibility of their, their offspring being wiped out. So they've stabilized to kind of that middle number, you know, six to twelve eggs, um, which is a large enough number to withstand any type of predator, possibly. You know, some might survive, but also a number that the, the parents, the, the mother or the father, could actually provide enough nutrients and resources to their offspring. Um, so they've stabilized as well. The last type of selection is disruptive selection. Um, with disruptive selection, uh, we have fitness on either side. So here. Uh, we'll talk about food source. This can happen with many, many different uh, types of um, types of pressures. But we can talk about food sources being the selection pressure. Um, maybe the the ancestral uh, bird landed on an island that had multiple food sources. So there were larger berries up in the canopy, and there were smaller insects or ants on the ground or something like that. Um, so therefore, they're selecting not for the large bees, not for the small bees, but both the large and the small bees. It's the median size beak that is the least fit. So over time, you can see that our curve will start to split. It will start to get a separation of traits. If this happens and these two populations remain separate from one another, this could eventually result in right, speciation, uh, which is the, the formation of new species. All right. Are we okay so far? Can I just finish this up? Uh, you guys find this a little bit. All right, cool. All right, so, so that kind of that's, that was the next thing. Kind of, kind of talked about how it affects populations. Now we really want to talk specifically about the speciation process. How are new species formed? Um, and when we talk about this, we really need to get to our definition of a species again. What was our definition of the species? We thought it was easy to define, right? But it's not so easy. But what definition are we going to go with? The ability to? Viable offspring. Viable offspring. that can reproduce on their own. That's key, right? A horse and a donkey are not the same species because when they produce a meal, a meal, a mule, right? The mule cannot reproduce on their, on their own, right? So they're not the same uh, species. They are not, the mule is not a viable offspring. Um, now, what we say at that point, what we say at that point, when we have a new species, when, when one population is now considered a new species from another population, it's the point of reproductive isolation. Organisms within the same species are not reproductively isolated from one another. Organisms from separate species are. What that means is when they try to reproduce, they are not able to either reproduce in the first part, or they don't produce viable offspring. At that point, we would consider, consider them reproductively isolated from one another. So, reproductive isolation is the ultimate goal. That's what that's what results in speciation, the formation of new species. That's the point at which we say we have a new species. Some ways that we can get there are behavioral, geographic, and temporal isolation. I'm going to give you the three main ones. These are the ones you absolutely need to know, and then I'm going to go to a whole list of other ones. Some of them are, are more important than others, but these are really the bulk at first. Behavioral isolation, right? Could be mating calls, mating dances, right? Could just be overall behavior. Um, could be coloration. 
best way to think about this, I, I'd like to kind of think about um, uh, mating calls with birds and think about the rainforest. Uh, interesting enough, um, birds that are beautiful, that are brightly colored, tend to have awful sounds. Birds that have very, very lovely bird songs tend to be fairly drab in color. Um, the reason is because they've selected different ways of attracting mates. The birds that are brightly colored live up in the canopy of the rainforest, uh, and their ability, their, their mode of finding a mate is visual. Hence, they're brightly colored, you can see them. Um, the ones with bird songs, though, typically are living down in the canopy. And therefore, there's not much of a visual sight line. So therefore, it's using more auditory mechanisms to attract mates. Just kind of an interesting fact. Um, but let's use mating call as an example. I have a population of uh, birds that live uh, in the rainforest. Um, within that population of birds, there are some variations in mating calls. There are some mating calls that are a little bit higher pitch. Some mating calls that are a little bit lower pitch. Now, initially, for, for many years, there was really no separation between the two. But all of a sudden, there started to be a little bit of selection there. Some birds started migrating towards the higher pitch bird song, right, and they would kind of stay as a mating group. Uh, and then other birds would, would, would migrate towards the lower pitch bird song. They'd be living in the same area, but they'd just be kind of um, attracted to the high versus the low. Now, that's a behavioral isolation. If those populations remain isolated from one another, it sets up the possibility. It doesn't automatically result in it, but it sets up the possibility for speciation or the formation of a new species. Um, we need to talk about gene pools. Right? When we say population, we're talking about the same species that have a gene pool that's interacting. Right? There, there's, there's an exchange of genetic information. If I have a separation within my population here with mating calls, I have the, the high pitch and the low pitch group, in order for speciation to occur, there can't be any crossover between their gene pools. Why? Because it's the genetic differences that cause the speciation events. The high-pitched birds need to keep their genes separate from the low-pitched birds. Because for speciation to occur, there needs to become enough genetic difference. So if they were to try to mate with one another, they are unable at this point to produce a viable offspring. If their gene pools are constantly crossing, are you going to get enough variation between the two gene pools? No, the mating is going to keep pulling them back closer together. So behavioral isolation could isolate two populations and prevent them from trying to reproduce with one another. If that happens for a long enough period of time, it could potentially result in the formation of a new species. But it doesn't mean it's going to. They can be isolated for hundreds of years. But just because they're isolated for 100 years doesn't mean that they're absolutely going to change enough genetically that they're going to be a new species. It could happen. The longer they're separated, the more of a chance it could happen. But it doesn't mean it's an automatic. Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, so also mating dances, right? Here's your, your two birds doing their little, um, little mating dances. Fun. Um, Geographic isolation is the easiest, right? Distance, uh, I'll, I'll show you a graph later on, right? The chance, for, the chance for reproductive isolation increases with distances between populations. Um, obviously, if you have a new mountain range that's formed, you know, way back when, a new river or a river changes locations, you can definitely think of like smaller insect populations. Also, there's a slight, slight shift in, in water levels. You can see populations being separated from one another. Um, but geographic isolation is powerful, right? That, that's probably the most powerful. Temporal isolation. This is happening right now. Our trees, our, our animals in this area have absolutely no clue what's going on this year. It was 72 degrees on Christmas Eve, right? It, did we even really have a winter? I think winter was like two days. Maybe like that one big snowstorm and that was it. Think about it. All of our trees are all trying to read the environment. Changes in temperatures, sunlight, things like that. Um, how much precipitation, water is in the ground, there's a lot of different factors, but they have no clue what time of year it is right now. So think about all of our flowering plants and all of our trees. Are they all going to be on the same page or opening up and preparing for pollination or to pollinate at the same time? Probably not. Probably not. Right? If that happens, you know, let's talk about oak trees uh, in general. 
Um, if, if one subset of the oak trees opens up early spring, because they're confused, another subset of oak trees opens up in late spring, because they don't know what's going on. Now, for this generation, for that year, they didn't mix. Their gene pools did not cross. Does that mean they're actually going to be a new species? No, but if that trend continues, could they form into a new species? Absolutely. You can put this to animals and frogs and mating. Like frogs might want to try to mate earlier in the spring or late in the spring and so forth. So the temporal isolation could lead to um, the formation of new species. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, all right. So those are the main ones. Here, here are some other ones. Um, this is key here, though. Habitat isolation is not geographic isolation. Geographic isolation is saying they're actually separated from one another by geography, by distance. Habitat isolation is saying that they're, they're occupying different niches. One here, this snake is kind of occupying a niche on land, where its subspecies is occupying a niche for water. That could happen. You have certain insects that all of a sudden start um, to occupying one level of a tree, and other insects might kind of migrate down to the ground. If the population separates according to habitat, it could lead to a new species. So habitat isolation is not geographic. Um, temporal isolation we talked about, behavioral isolation we talked about. These, if you add geographic in there, these are pre-zygotic barriers. Pre-zygotic means pre-zygote, so before a zygote is formed. All right. Other types of barriers. Uh, could be mechanical isolation. You might have some type of mutation or change in a population that no longer allows one portion of the population to mate with the other. Mechanically not a bit, not able to. Um, that would be a post-psychotic barrier. So the first three are important. Mechanical, not bad to know, but not not, not a main focus. Um, the pre psychotic are key, though, knowing that concept. Um, gamete isolation. Mechanically, they might be fine, but maybe there was a change chemically in the gametes. Remember, the sperm in order to enter the egg needs to bind to a receptor. If there's a mutation in a receptor, the sperm can no longer bind to an egg. So it kind of gives you something to really think about. Uh, and then you might have a separate, separation of the population because of mutation. Um, now, all of those were post-fertilization. After fertilization, other barriers that we have are reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and hybrid breakdown. They all seem very similar, but they're a little bit different. Um, here's our hybrid fertility is your mule. Mules can't reproduce, they're infertile. I think it's because horses and donkeys have different number of mules. So I think when they, when they form a mule, I think the mule has an odd number of, of, of not alleles, but chromosomes. I think the mule has an odd number of chromosomes. I think it's the major effect. I'm not positive. I think that's it. Um, but here, the, the post I got to bear is mules can't reproduce. Therefore, you don't have to worry about them ever becoming the same species. Um, reduce hybrid viability, saying, hey, guess what? They can produce a hybrid. The hybrid doesn't, doesn't survive too well, right? Um, maybe one's a brown, uh, and one's a black salamander. Uh, so they both have different environments in order to kind of hide in. When they reproduce, they produce this bright red one that all the predators love to eat, right? So therefore, it's not a very viable uh, hybrid. Right? It's not going to survive well in the wild. Doesn't mean it's infertile. It just means that it's going to be keep being knocked down. So the hybrids don't don't survive. The last one's hybrid breakdown. This is actually what the corn industry uses. Um, this is what happens with with our corn crops. Monsanto. Right? Monsanto's awful. Uh, well, they do some in general. They do some bad things. Um, Monsanto has capitalized our corn crop. Right. So therefore, all the corn you eat in this country, for the most part, is Monsanto corn. Uh, what they do is. They have uh, patented the seeds. So therefore, in order to grow corn, you pretty much have to buy one side of seeds. They've also designed the seeds for hybrid breakdown. So when you grow the seeds, a farm is supposed to be kind of self-sufficient, sustaining. That's the concept of farming. Um, but Monsanto corn produce seeds that have offspring that are not viable, the hybrid breakdown. So Monsanto has designed their corn so when the corn are harvested, you can't harvest those seeds to grow the next generation. Because the next generation is weaker. And then the next generation is weaker. In fact, they'll even sue you if you're trying to do that. Um, so it's not a very good thing. 
Uh, it also happens in nature where hybrids break down. They, they might be able to produce a hybrid, but the next generation, next generation is weaker, so it dies out. Um, but Santo just used that concept. So, what's that? That's what they do. That's how they make yeah. Yeah, that's big. Yeah. I was four years ago, my first year teaching class, I went to one of the breaks. I showed two notes. And as soon as I and then right before break, I got an anonymous letter written to me and written to the uh, superintendent. Uh, so basically, ripping apart me, saying now I was talking about false. In the army, they said I, I said that um, something crazy, something crazy didn't make any sense anymore. But it was kind of fun. So, anyways, um, but I, got, I digress. Something that sits in my sometimes never happens. It still makes me mad. Um, any case. Uh, so hybrid breakdown. So that, that's kind of what Monsanto uses. Um, what do we need to know here? Again, I would know the hybrid breakdown, fertility, hybrid viability, um, the genetic isolation, and the mechanical isolation. I, I wouldn't. They're all good to know. It's not like you need to get specific on, but they're all kind of like they're they're arrows in your quiver, right? If you have a question dealing with something like this, you have many many different things you can talk about. I would definitely know the habitat temporal behavior. You have to know that. And definitely understand the concept of pre-zygotic, post-zygotic. Okay. This is kind of looking at that hybrid viability aspect, this graph right here. Um, so I have my initial population. We have gene flow within our populations. Now all of a sudden some barrier comes um, shows up. This barrier here, it could be behavioral, it could be, it could be temporal, it could be habitat, uh, it could be any of the above. There's some barrier there. So now I have a separation between the populations. So there's a barrier there. Their gene pools are no longer crossing. This barrier might be for five years, 10 years, 100 years. Who knows? It could be for any period of time. As you can see, you can start seeing slight genetic change between the two. But at some point, maybe the two populations start to breed together again. At that point, you get what you have is hybrids, hybrids between the two. There's a number of things that can happen here, depending on how much genetic change has happened. Um, there could be reduced hybrid viability, as kind of shown in the first outcome here, where the hybrids really just die off. They're not really fit in the environment. They don't do well. So therefore, it kind of reinforces the formation of a speciation event. So in the first outcome, it's going to kind of force that speciation event. In the second one, the hybrids might just blend back in with both populations, just kind of bring the populations back together. So therefore, there was really no speciation effect. There was just some separation, some genetic variation, and they come right back together. Or in the third case, it kind of you know represents the um, the, the formation of kind of a, a new subset of the species. So that hybrid is viable, and it just becomes a part of the population. So we had this increase in variation. So here, if we go back to kind of the initial levels of variation, and, and the third situation, it kind of maintains variation. The hybrid is viable, and it also kind of maintains itself within the population. The first one is the one that results in the speciation event. Uh, this is just a vocab term. Speciation can happen two different ways geographically. It can happen in a sympatric or an allopatric situation. If it happens in a sympatric speciation, it means the speciation event was not caused by geography or habitat. I don't want to say habitat, but geography. They could be in the same habitat. So therefore, the populations aren't able to co-mingle. They're mingling with one another. They could reproduce if they wanted to, but they are not. So some other barriers in effect. That is sympatric speciation versus allopatric speciation where you have some type of barrier, or some type of physical barrier, geographic barrier. Those are two vocab words you just kind of need to know. This is just an inter interesting graph looking at geographic isolation. So you can look at how much isolations occur. So basically it's really kind of looking at genetic change on the y-axis distance on the x-axis. As distance increases, the amount of genetic change, therefore re increasing uh, reproductive isolation is increasing as well. So if we plotted that line, you'd get some type of, of linear fit like this. So just kind of showing increased distances um, increases the effect of possibly becoming reproductively isolated. 
All right. Couple, uh, let me just see. All right, I'm going to talk about two more things, and then we're going to pause. Um, uh, and then we'll have like one more little section we'll talk through in, in a few minutes. Um, speciation events can happen very quick. Not necessarily with higher level animals, but with lower level animals and plants that can deal with the process of polyploidy, speciation event can happen in one generation. So you want to think of this as mainly being over time. However, if you have a polyploid situation, so in the formation of gametes, right? So failure cell division after chromosome duplication gives rise to a tetra, uh, sorry, tetraploid tissue. So basically what happens is we've now increased our number, and instead of being just a diploid cell, we are a tetraploid cell. We are a foreign cell because of just problems with separation during gamete formation. If that happens, your gamete is not going to be a 2N. I'm sorry, not going to be a, an N cell. It's going to be a 2N cell. And if that gamete fuses with another gamete, all of a sudden I have a plant that has dramatically different chromosome numbers which means that plant technically is a new species, which happened over one generation. Now, does that mean that that plant can't reproduce with its, with its parental plant? It, it might. These plants are you know, they're not really defined by that. They're, 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 they're more open to breeding with other species. But technically, that would be a new species. So just kind of all we need to know here is that the polyploid process in low-level organisms can result in speciation over one generation, where typically speciation takes a lot longer. Um, this right here is known as autopolyploid, where you just have one species involved. Allopolyploid is saying having the same effect, but having two different species coming together. So it's almost like a third species is formed in this case. But they're both just kind of polyploid, single, you know, one generation effects. We will pause there. How did they know that blood? Um, 